morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, NRC board meeting of January 11th. And uh, with that, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Our microphones were really loud. <laughs> okay. okay, and critical paper roll call. Division one. Here. Division two. Here. Division three. Here. Division four. Here. Division five. Here. So we'll start with public comment for items not on the agenda. Madam President, I would make, I would move the consent agenda as it is items um, 3A through 2L. For approval. I'll second. Public comment. Public comment. And the consent agenda. Um, division four. Aye. Division one. Yes. Division three. Five. Oh, I'm here last now. All right. <laughs> division two. Yeah, aye. Oh, there we go. Division five. Yes. Division two. Boy. How about one? Or how about three? Okay. Okay. I write this down. Oh, we switched chairs. Three. Yeah. Yeah. I need to switch chairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. So our workshop item is the job description for the GIS panel. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, it's been a long time since we last met. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so today we're here to have a discussion about a new job uh, description, the GIS Analyst 1-2. Um, of course, this is overall part of our strategic priority that we talked about, right, which is the, the technology and innovation investment. Um, but what we got is the, the district's needs of the GIS system are, are really growing and the, the tools that that program allows us to do, um, there's a lot of value in that. And so what we need is somebody that's more capable of, of uh, the implementation and planning stage of the GIS. You know, it's the programming stuff, it's the, the versioning, it's managing the portals, it's um, developing a lot of the different tools that, that we can use. And currently all we have is a GIS tech position which is really more of an entry level position, which is about in, you know inputting data. This is a new valve. This is a new update for a water line that was put in, developing some basic maps. And so this person now is somebody that can has a much higher level in terms of the ability to utilize and um, improve this tool. <clears throat> you know some of the things that obviously the CMMS that's a big one. We're switching to the uh, the the what's it the cloud through the portal. That's about all I know with regards to that, so don't ask me any details specific. Um, so as part of that, we're having to implement that. So that's a whole process in and of itself to be able to transition our system over into that. You know, there's other tools that we can utilize in there when we start to look at with the CMS, areas where we can identify programs we can run and say, okay, here's an area where we're having a lot of trouble with our system. This is a priority. Maybe we need to take a look at leaks over in this area. Um, also, things like we'll be able to utilize it to maximize efficiency in flushing, so our crews can go out there and say whether it's emergency or normal, here's the areas that we can utilize to maximize the flushing so we're getting the water through our system without using as much or as little water as possible. So this is very common. Um, if you look in the staff report, all the other local agencies all have these two different levels. They have the tech position and the analyst position. 
So we did take a look at that. Uh, one of the attachments to that is the salary survey. If you want to take a look at that. And so we looked at uh, PCWA, both Placer um, and Nevada County, as well as the City of Lincoln. All of those folks have GIS analyst position. Um, and so we took an average of those. And so what you can see is the GIS 1 uh, tops out with an average of the 95,820 and the 2 at 107,695, which, as you can see right below with the current salaries, going from the GIS tech 2 position to an analyst position is about 11%, which is pretty common for the jump up into the, into the next phase. Um, and so this is what we would propose in terms of the analysts, in terms of the steps, five steps, starting at the the one and the two positions, as you see there. Um, in addition, we also have the proposed job description. Um, I won't go into the detail of reading all of that. Um, maybe if you have any specific questions with regards to that, I can try to answer those for you. How many um, people will be in this department? So in the in the short term, I envision there will ultimately be two. There would be our GIS analysts, and then eventually, probably in the next budget cycle, we would be potentially looking for a GIS tech. Right now, we only have a single GIS tech person that's doing all of that. Yeah, two, two. Yeah. Currently, we have one. Currently, we have one who's operating basically mm -hmm. at the analyst level as we try to move forward with all this stuff. Yeah. And still, this we'd have to uh, budget for a new position. Uh, so ultimately, we would have to budget for a new position. Um, the fact that I have current vacancies open, and in addition, I recently had a had an unforeseen retirement. Um, I don't think I need to worry about in terms of my budget approved for this year. Even if we do fill this position, I have money within the overall budget of my of the various positions that we wouldn't have to budget a new position in this year's 2023 budget. Yeah, per our personal personnel regulations, we would have to do an internal recruitment. Yeah. And the idea being that there's currently only one person who has a GIS background. And so we wouldn't be increasing our full-time account for 2022. But if we were to add in a tech position at some later date, for example, in 2023, then that would cause an increase. But that would be a, a separate action that would become before the board later. Yeah. This current action wouldn't require any additional budget amendment besides just a reflection on the organizational chart that we're reclassifying the current technician to an analyst. Uh, okay, so that's what I want to clarify. So the, the current person working in the, the only person working as GIS tech slash analyst will be elevated to this analyst role. Yep. So we would have to bring forward, if this is approved, it has to be a step-by-step -step process. So if this is approved, then we will bring forward an organizational chart amendment to the board before we advertise internally for this promotional opportunity. So then if the board adopts the new org chart, then we would do the internal recruitment. It would essentially go away because we wouldn't, when we bring the new org chart forward, we wouldn't be asking for an increase in full time equivalents. That would likely be in some future action, which would probably be in 2023 or 2024. I'm sorry. So in 2023, you don't see two head count being in the GIS positions. There are right. positions. Uh, correct. I mean, we would we would take a look at that as we move forward, depending on how the CMS plays out. Um, but currently, we have the one that's that's handling the full workload at the moment. Yeah. Okay. We would have to come back at a later date for that. Yeah, I would think we would do that as part of um, next year's budget request would be to to do that. Which may be a, a, a situation where we just move people around and may not even increase the overall number of full time equivalents. You just may be moving them from. You know, taking one position that we didn't fill in the and converting it. Okay. Because like an engineering tech and a GIS tech are basically the same pay scale. So, and I have a couple engineering tech positions that are currently open. I was going to note we can't hear you very well. Mic forward to you. 
Yeah. So I, I'm a firm believer in GIS and the efficiencies that it presents. I mean, it's just amazing how you grasp the situation really clearly and what, you know, the, the future directions we need to do. Um, but after everything is established on GIS, GIS layers, is there that much work afterwards? So things are constantly changing, updates and things. Correct. Like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And work. And we've just we've just we touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of this tool and what we can use it for. You know, things like our survey department and all the information we collect with with control points and property boundaries and some of those things. All those things can get incorporated into the GIS. So in the future. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we go out to do one project here and we happen to have another project that's just a quarter mile or half a mile away. Now they'll be able to use that information and say, yeah, we've already got stuff established here and here. They can go back, use that. It becomes much more efficient that way. So there's continuing pieces that we'll add. So any extension lines, you could just put that in? The yeah, those are relatively straightforward. How many right? people mm -hmm. are, are willing to go for it and pay for it or you know, get hooked up? Yeah, just about any amount of data we collect can be tied into GIS through tying it to a geospatially located data point. Yeah, we can identify how many customers are connected to a, a pipeline that's installed, right? And how many are vacant, how many vacant parcels, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And then would, would we start keeping track of dry wells or reports? <laughs> Uh, we can. The, the the information is there available. It's not something that we do. We're not involved yeah. with yeah. The, with that. So that's. I mean, that's a county yeah county but thing. Somehow we could figure that out. If if the direction is to include that kind of information in there, we can do that in the program. But we currently do not do that. Yeah. Well, my, I guess my point is, if we're looking soft service areas that we can extend into. There might be a critical mass. Yeah, if, if the county has information mapped out in their system, we can utilize that information and bring it into ours and overlay it so we can look and develop maps that say, okay, here's an area per the county GIS that says this section has a bunch of wells that are poor performing or failing, et cetera. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That kind of thing we can do. I'm interested in what our tech experts. <laughs> Fellow board members have to say. I'm looking forward to your comments. Yeah, no, I, I actually think this is great. Uh, my, I guess my biggest concern is always training. You know, if we're elevating a position, just making sure that uh, we're, we're leveraging the, the software manufacturers training as well as any industry training that we can do. So we should definitely talk about whatever this uh, candidate would need to, to make them as efficient as possible. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's even in the. Uh, in the job description yeah, I read, read that we talk about attending training to enhance the system yeah, yeah, I think knowledge that, and all that. that. I would absolutely. heavily recommend it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I think it's that, but I'm glad to see this come forward. Thank you. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. Given, Given direction to move forward. Yeah. Okay. So then the next step is bring this back in a formal public meeting for approval. And as the board is aware, when we propose either job description changes or something that we think that the board will desire greater input on, we bring it in a workshop format and then we incorporate any input and then we bring it back for formal approval. Yeah. Awesome. You can. It's your desire as to whether you want to or not. Okay. Is there any other comment on this position? Seeing we'll move on to the general manager's report. Thank you, President Hull. So the general manager's report is going to be focused on the topic that I'm sure is at the front of everyone's <laughs> mind. It's all of these forefronts. Uh, we have been, as everybody in the state is aware, been experiencing storm after storm after storm, which is great. We have had not had um, any super large operational incidents, normal down trees, debris, those types of things. But Chip is going to provide a more thorough overview of the precipitation state because I know everyone's excited about it. All right. Yes. All right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, please. Great start to the year, huh? Yeah, yeah. 
with a forecast of dry winter. <laughs> yeah. Well, remember, it was 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we kind of threw together some numbers for you all today. This is as of this morning or some of them from yesterday, but go ahead and go to the next slide if you would, please. I guess I got the clicker here, huh? So here's some of the great news. The Bowman Lake precipitation uh, as of yesterday is sitting at 45 inches of precip, which is 155% of average. This is a good slide to focus on uh, initially here. What I want to point out is that green line you see on the slide there is last year. And last year, we started off like gangbusters. We were all very happy, but then look what happened. It flatlined. This year, we started a little slower. We've now passed last year, but there's still an opportunity for us to flatten out. So okay. that's something we always have in the back of our mind, although I will say the 10-day forecast continues to look promising. So Fingers crossed that uh, we continue to have a normal winter from here on out and we'll finish really strong. So that 45 inches we've, re we've received to date is already higher than we received in uh, 2020 and almost as much as we received in 2019 already. And we're just, we're just getting started. Yep, can I yeah. ask one quick question about that? So when you say precip, are you counting the snow too? It, yes, it's okay, all. Snow a, and rain. Correct. I know Total we're both there. Yeah, okay. so they, they take the whatever's captured in the snow bucket and uh -huh. they melt it off and capture it as Oh, well. okay. And that's actually rather difficult because uh, you yeah. know, Bowman Lake's not easy to access. And this is Kean's team doing that up there, making it into that station and having to melt off the snow to get the numbers. So sometimes it takes us a little while to get the, sure. the latest and greatest. So it, it's quite an effort. Well, that's helpful to know. Yeah. No survey starts in February. We'll get to that here in just a second, but yes. Are we having a raffle? <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a slide so you can cheat a little bit and we'll <laughs> state's numbers. Okay, NID reservoir storage also looking very good at 222,000, basically 223,000 acre feet, which is 120% of our nine year average and 82% of overall capacity. So we're well above where we were this time last year by about 50,000 acre feet. Uh, the thing is, moving forward, you're going to see this line kind of start to flatten out, and that's because our lower elevation reservoirs are all full and spilling. We have nowhere else to put the water. Our upper elevation reservoirs are probably not going to see an abundance of inflow until we start seeing snow melt. Mm -hmm. So we're really in very good shape as far as the reservoirs go. And as we move into the snowpack, as you just mentioned, that also is looking very promising. So. This is from DWR. We have not done our own snow survey yet. Uh, we expect to do one at the end of the month. Um, really, can you get a chopper up there right now anyway? But uh, we expect to do one in February, beginning of February. Using DWR, I think they're using a lot of automated sensors out there in the field, snow pillows and whatnot. But regardless, their numbers are, are quite impressive. So you have the Northern Sierra index shows 184 percent of average the central sierra index is 228 and then southern is 269. also more importantly the number on the left is what we expect to see on april 1st basically after winter's over and you can see the central sierra has already surpassed that so there's quite a snowpack uh, building up in the mountains the one thing i will say is that it seems to be very specific in elevation so at bowman lake at the beginning of these storms, we had about two foot of snow on the ground up there. And recently, these storms have been much warmer than that, and so it's been rain on that. And so there's not a huge snowpack around that 5,000 foot level, but after you get above that, it piles up really quick. When the precipitation falls on the snow that's already there, does it, the water still goes into that. It just makes the, the water content of that snowpack heavier, right? Correct, yes. It's a big sponge. Yeah. Unless you get too much, and then, right. then it comes off in <clears throat> sheet yes. rolls of water. But, yes. uh, yeah, and it's these storms have been interesting. They've been bouncing up and down in elevation, right. so I think that's been absorbing into the snow, freezing, and then doing it all over again, which is great. We'll know more when our crews get up there and do a snow survey, and they'll actually put a probe through those layers of ice that have formed and, and get a true water content, and it'll be a much more accurate measurement than this. Okay, thank you. 
Now I'm going to walk you through the state's reservoirs. That first uh, gangbuster storm we had on New Year's really hit us pretty hard. We had almost 10 inches of rain here. It was impressive. But the northern part of the state didn't see quite as much as we did. And so Lake Shasta was a little slow to respond, but you can see now it has turned the corner and it's on its way back up. Right now it's at 70% uh, of average for this time of year, but only about 42% of capacity. So it's still pretty low. It's going about 60,000 acre feet a day. <clears throat> it's impressive and it hopefully- next storm. Yeah, it will hopefully continue that turn. Trinity, same thing, uh, slow to respond. Um, doesn't have quite the same watershed filling it, but uh, it's at least turned the corner, and so we hope that that continues. It's at 26% uh, of overall capacity and 43% of average for this time of year, so it's really lagging. But as you move further down the state, things start to really improve, and here's Lake Orville. It's a straight line up. You can see it's filling in a hurry, and it's at 47% of overall capacity, but 88% of average for this time of year. I would imagine we're gonna pass that uh, average mark here in the next couple of storms. And then there's Folsom. Uh, <laughs> this looks like an EKG right there. <laughs> it filled in a hurry and they dumped in a hurry because they have to utilize that for flood control. So although the numbers look like, oh, it's only at 42%, well, that's because they dumped a major portion of what came in. It's currently at 99% of average for this time of year. And then Bullards, same situation there. They have filled in a hurry. I would imagine they'll start dumping for flood control. I mean, I think they're already releasing, but they may have to really turn the corner and, and release more. But they're at 73% of capacity, 116% of average. So those reservoirs look really good, but the state is going to continue their drought messaging, and I think this slide shows you why. Uh, basically, what you see is the trend lines on this slide show you the previous drought years. So the 87 through 90, the 13 through 16, and then the black line is current. And what you can see is that we're still behind in overall reservoir storage conditions, even as compared to last drought years. So we've got some distance to make up still. I will say though that if the snowpack continues and if we continue to have a normal winter for the rest of the months ahead, uh, things should really improve tremendously and, and we'll start to have a serious conversation of whether we're still in drought or not. I think also the state is tying this to groundwater aquifers and they're not recharging as fast as they need to. Well, and I think the more they continue to use the bypasses, the Tisdale weirs and those kinds of things and just flood the, the valley floor, it uh, is more opportunity to infiltrate the ground. Help. So yeah. yeah. I know I traveled across the valley uh, this last weekend and it was wet all the way across the causeway. So that was interesting. Good to see. <clears throat> so the drought monitor, this was December 6th and the next slide shows you how much it's improved. This was as of January 3rd. I suspect that will continue to improve as we move further into winter. And then likewise, this was the seasonal drought outlook. Um, gosh, this was in early December. And then the latest one shows a dramatic improvement, and I would imagine that will continue as well. The, on the previous slide, yes, sir. Take a look at the west side of the both valleys, San Joaquin and Sacramento. A lot of political power there. Are you talking about this one? Yep. Yeah. It's the whole west side that's dry. Well, and the other part of this is that usually the southern half of the state is in much worse shape. The last few storms have really hit south of us pretty hard. Yeah. It hit us too, not quite as hard as them, which I appreciate because our canals were easier to manage. <laughs> um, but they really do need the water down there, and it's good to see they're getting it. Not only that, it, <clears throat> they marched across the, the Rockies too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a big part of the news is Lake Mead. Yeah, that Colorado <clears throat> is really suffering. Seasonal temperature outlook really hasn't changed 50-50. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and seasonal precipitation outlook. This one cracks me up because it also hasn't changed. And we're kind of breaking all the records right now, but, you know, it's 50-50. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. Uh, and then last but not least, our conservation. For, for the year, we did pretty darn good. We did 11% less than in 2020 on our treated water usage. 
And that's pretty darn close to what the governor was asking for, that 15% mark. Um, so I, I commend our tree to water customers for cutting back. They did a great job. And uh, we'll see where it goes from here. Do you have a similar chart for raw water? I don't. Okay. There's so many variables and how much goes into the system that it's hard to track year by year because the temperatures, the soil conditions, all those things we talked about right. last night played huge, huge roles in how much we actually have to distribute. Right. Treated waters easier contained, easier yep. to track. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Another good news. Oh wait, you know what? I'm sorry. I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so a lot of folks are wondering, you know, how are we doing with all of this? Is it? Are we? You know, we're overtopping, we're spilling the whole areas. What is the integrity of the system? Is it flowing through? Are we doing okay? Are we not? And kind of what is the sort of overall temperature of how our system is doing? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, actually. Uh, some of our irrigation water customers are a bit frustrated with us at the moment, only because when the storms roll in hot and heavy like this, we turn the canals off. And we're doing that on purpose to prevent flooding and prevent property damage. <clears throat> When you have these storms that are marching in one after another, we really don't have time to put the system completely back together and then the next day gut it again because it's raining again. Right. So when it rains heavy, canals are full of rainwater, people are fine, they're getting their deliveries. When we get that one day lull in between storms, the canals dry back up, people don't get their water for a day until the rain hits again. That's been ongoing now since New Year's. And so we've been getting a few calls. We've been informing folks we're doing the best we can. We're trying to, to keep flooding at, at a minimum. And so far, our crews have done a great job. I'm happy to report no reports of overtopping or flooding or any property damage other than a few tree falls from the wind. Nothing we can do there. Today, though, we turned that corner. We see the forecast is lightening up a little bit. The storms are maybe a little bit lighter, and we started putting the water back into the canals at minimum flows so those in-home users can uh, start using the water again. So that's the good news. Okay. And you're talking about consumptive, consumption use? Yes, basically those folks that use hey. canal water in-home just for you know flushing of toilets or showering right. or whatever. And there's what, 100 and something of them? I think. Oh, there's quite a few yeah. more than that. There's roughly 1,000. Oh, there's Gosh, a lot. I thought it was a smaller. I <clears throat> have been recommending to my two that they get a tank, right? Yeah. <laughs> they call. Yeah. The yeah, water's gone, right. right? I go, <clears throat> when it forecast for weather, they're going to shut off the ditch. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> the forecast I saw was for five to seven and a half inches starting tomorrow into Monday. Is that true? Yes, it's a little more spread out than some of those earlier storms were. We're seeing about an inch and a half a day. We think we can handle that. Uh, okay. But we're going to have all, all hands on deck. Our, our maintenance crew also joined us in operations, and we sent the whole team out on these canals during these rounds of storms, and we've we've had to gut everything. And it has paid off, though, because, like I said, limited damage, which is awesome. I have one other, just a comment, really, and I don't know how much the rest of the board knows, but I know that our staff, maybe maintenance staff, went up to the town of Washington because oh. they were under a boil order. Mm -hmm. They still are. They still are. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just appreciate our staff going up there and helping out in that way. Um, I know the county was really helpful, yeah. too. You know, how, ma how many staff did we end up sending up there to help? So currently the status is that our big labor effort, which isn't that big, it'll be about four staff members for probably six hours to help them disinfect their tank. Mm -hmm. They received a huge slug of mud into their treatment plant, which clogged their sand filters. Mm -hmm. So they have to pull all the sand, all the media out of the sand filters and then have it replaced once um, they meet some inspection and testing requirements. They still haven't been able to remove the media from the second filter and they don't have the extra He's on staff to be able to clean the tank. So we're going to assist them with cleaning the tank. County Environmental Health called us to see if we could provide some assistance because they are, are on a boil order right now, and they have very limited staff. They have right. one, treat, one operator, 
And then one basically retired a annuitant that's kind of like a consultant to operate their plant. So they're in a little bit of a bad situation right now. But, you know, this is what agencies do. We try to help our neighbors as much as we can. And it really is a nominal cost, so it's good to get them back up and running. Yeah, I just really appreciate that we are in a position to do that and that we've done it. So thank you all. Who, how, yeah, many, yeah. how many sand media filters do they have? Two. Two. <laughs> They, and unfortunately, the way those are constructed, they have to remove the media by hand in five gallon buckets. I was going to say, with a shovel, <laughs> shovel in a bucket, yeah. yeah so, oh, and they had goodness. to call on volunteers from within the town to do that. Right. Oh, yeah. my goodness. And, they're, and they're larger. Yes, yeah. They're, I mean, they're fairly big. It's a fairly small system. Um, mm -hmm. You know, throughout my career, especially in public works, I have been in the position of having to call on our neighboring agencies for help for either parts or whatever it is. So when it's these kind of nominal things, we, especially when there's a boil order and a health and safety issue, yeah. we try to help out. So I have three sand meter filters on our irrigation system, and we can I can just get and flush it. You know, instead of digging it, but we were digging it out by hand for a while. Oh, God. And unfortunately, this is just in a location you can't get any equipment up there. Yeah. Is how the plant is located on kind of the side of a hill. A forever project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Anyway, thank you everybody for doing yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Can you give us an update on the, the Bear River uh, burn scar area? How it's weathered through these. Rain. It's been doing fairly well. We did receive quite a few debris at Combi with the last storms, but I don't know that it was related to the burn scar, Ken. Yeah, I think they're more local debris. Yeah, I think um, it was local. It was wooded debris, trees. Boats and docks. Boats, docks. Boats and docks. Yeah. Docks floating away. Yeah, and a lot of docks are floating away on Combi, the private docks, if they didn't secure them properly with <laughs> storms. We have a little bit of a mess going on out there. What do we do to rectify that? They're going to have to go fish them out with their own boats. So it's not affecting our operation too much? Not at this point. Yeah, eventually we'll have to go clean them off the lock them out there, but yeah. there's just too much flow to go mess with it right now. Yeah. The booms are designed to catch all that debris, so the, when the flows come back down, we'll, we'll go clean up whatever mess remains. Are, there, are the docks up against the log boom? They were as of the, Jan the New Year's Eve storms. I haven't seen them in the last couple of days. So. Okay. Are, are all those permitted ducks? <laughs> that, that is, <laughs> we're still <laughs> dealing with the permitting <laughs> of they those docks. They are. Well, they can't rebuild now without a permit, right? Yeah, they would have, a, I think almost all of the docks are updated and permitted. So all the other facilities would have to go out. But I think for most of the docks, Pays if if the homeowner or the owner of the dock did not secure it properly, and it floats away, and then we have to go in and help you know pull it out of wherever it landed. Is that an NID expense or is that a homeowner expense? Uh, an NID expense. The cost of trying to be reimbursed for it would cost more than more the actual than reimbursement. Can we sell the wood? Well, I don't know that all the docks get ruined. <laughs> Those docks are pretty hardy. They typically just float and have to be moved again. Uh, it depends on if they get broken out. <laughs> if <laughs> Kian goes in and he puts on his diver suit, suit to rescue. Out there on the log, you can grab an excavator or a backhoe and put into a ten-car truck and haul it off. Uh -huh. If people want their dock fish. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm just wondering, how is the high country area? Do we have any concerns about landslides or mudslides or anything like that? We have, we have the normal avalanche concerns, right? When you see these rain, snow, right. rain, snow sort of events, it, it, it can make things interesting from that standpoint. But everything's functioning up there, as Chip alluded to. There's a significant amount of room in uh, Bowman Reservoir for incoming flows. Jackson Meadows still got a lot of room. So uh, it, there's a lot of snow, but seem to be moving along. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? That was uh, it. I, I have, uh, um, could we have Kian, he reported last night about the power generation. You told, told a couple of us, could you tell the rest of the board? Absolutely. Is Kian's prepared to do so? <laughs> put him, put you on the spot. Well, he did a great job at living last night. So. No, I think, uh, um, I guess the highlights are uh, December was our highest 
grossing month at the Combe South powerhouse um, ever, um, or at least since I've been doing this job. Um, I don't remember the exact number. It was in the neighborhood of $230,000 in uh, um, just power generation revenue. That doesn't include all the environmental credits and, and, and whatnot. Those kind of roll in later. Um, that's that's I typically budget three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand in revenue out of that powerhouse in a year. So that one month um, made our year. Um, power prices right now are through the roof. Um, there's some larger issues at play here. The whole conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine has really uh, played with uh, gas prices, fuel prices in general. Um, December was an extremely cold month, um, and so there were some uh, uh, natural gas price issues um, that, that crept into the market, and we were seeing <coughs> prices on the order of $500 a megawatt hour. Um, in the spring months, power can, can sometimes go negative in pricing, so we'll see less than $0 um, if we generate, and, an, and, and kind of an average number would be in the $30 to $50 a megawatt hour, so we're, prices are 10 times um, what they would, would normally be, and fortunately, we were able to, uh, to respond to those signals and, and do really well out of, uh, out of the little engine that could down there. So. And can you uh, refresh our memory? Which, uh, how many of our plants are not part of the PG&E power purchase agreement? So um, the the main Yuba Bear power purchase agreement is Bowman, uh, Chicago Park, Dust Flat Number Two, and Rollins. Uh, Combe South we sell to um, NCPA. Uh, well, they they wheel it through their member agencies um, as a, a market price sort of scenario. Combe North is sold to PG&E um, through a, um, an old program that they have. It'll convert to the uh, NCPA probably here in next year. And then uh, Scotts Flat is the, the program where we sell the energy to ourselves. So, so Combe North, is that, uh, are we, are we at, have a fixed price that we receive on that one? Yes. From the past? Uh, well, it, it's, <clears throat> it's fixed in that it's based on season of generation, hour of generation, um, and so, but it is it is very set in stone what those prices are, as opposed to Combi North, which responds to larger market signals, so. And are we generating all, all the plants all running? All the plants yep. Are? yep, everything's running right now. So uh, Scotts Flats at capacity, Combi North is at capacity, Combi South is at capacity, and then as they as the water moves through and the, the time of the day moves through, then the others respond to that. They respond. The PG&E says when to turn it on. Uh, yeah. Assuming there's not enough water to run yeah. uh, full capacity. So um, when, during these big storms, there's plenty of water. We can run everything all out when we get a day like this where the runoff is kind of <clears throat> dropping back down. Then Chicago Park and, and Dutch Flat will only run certain hours of the day. Okay. So. Yeah, and then I guess Bowman is uh, at very low generation right now as we wait for that to fill. So. Okay. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, do we track this a little? I mean, like not a monthly, but when there's significant changes, let us know. I mean, it's just fascinating to to understand the marketplace because the geopolitical things are not going to change soon. That's going to keep happening, and then the certainly the political, um, I'm not going to, whatever it is, on fossil fuels is not going to change soon. Um, so this could happen. This could keep going on for a number of years. Uh, yeah. Where, yeah, like Combi South could be really generating some heavy duty income to us. It'll be interesting. I, I certainly don't have the crystal ball to predict the market, and I, I, the, the the huge negative to all of these storms is that here in March, April sort of time frame, when all this snow starts coming off, there's going to be a tremendous amount of hydropower generation, and prices will go significantly negative in that time frame. If okay. if there is other sources that are still, you know, you don't know if solar and wind will be you know, generating that much and fossil fuels, certainly, uh, I mean, obviously, the fed, feds are looking to get rid of gas stoves. I mean, do we really have that much hydro that? to uh, affect the market that way? Do we, or no, in, is there in the a state or the nation? In the state, there is a, a significant, uh, significant amount of hydro. Really? The way the uh, imports out of the Pacific Northwest work, um, there's a whole lot of hydro up there that oh. has access to California markets. Okay. Yeah. Lewis County gets six cents a kilowatt hour. I don't know. Their retail charge. Yeah. Because yeah. they import it from north. 
Yeah. Thank you, Kent. Okay, so if nothing else, we'll move on to the uh, director report, and I would start with Rich. Okay. Um, uh, kudos to Aurora. She did some homework and really had to dig into some of our records and is now ha helping Canyon Creek. Um, Chip, thank you also and her team. Um, solving a multi-year problem, and it looks like it's it's going to work out really well, and there's a lot of happy customers out there. Um, something smaller, um, but I think significant, is that on December 31st at noon, in front of the Nevada County Post Office, a, a truck came boring through, and a lot of water on the road, kicking up, spraying the water like crazy. So everybody was kind of getting, oof. An ID truck came through, slow, didn't splash anybody. I just want to thank that driver because right. I was one of those who gotten splashed. <laughs> so uh, just being, you know, situational awareness and uh, thank you. Um, something personal. Um, Olivia got her final African visa today and she's flying out to the Canary Islands. I don't know if you know Olivia's she's a former NID employee for three months and then our daughter. So she hits the Canary Islands and Trevor knows her well. Um, and Chris, um, so she hits Canary Islands on Friday and then to London. Um, and the, they're trekking over to Italy. Then they're gonna take a ferry to Tunisia and that's when the, uh, the attempt to two break uh, two world records start. And Russ Cook is going to run the length of Africa, 9,600 miles, 40 miles a day. We'll look forward to hearing status reports from time to time. And the, it's interesting, the hardest thing was getting visas mm -hmm. to the African countries. Mm -hmm. It's just very, very difficult. And she found a unique way of doing it, couch surfing, and got an invitation. Good. And that's how you get into Africa. Awesome, thank you, Rich. Yeah. Ricky? Um, yeah, just a couple things. But, you know, I've been handling various constituent issues with trees and fire hydrants and this, that, and the other thing. And fire thanks hydrants. to all the, all the staff who have been helpful and awesome. Our staff is awesome. <laughs> That's what I can say about that. Um, I also attended the swearing in of our new board of supervisors and we'll just share with you it was it was not not only a nice event but the former chair Sue Hook who is a friend of Rich's gave a very brief presentation and a thank you and um, it would touch me because she said I want to see all of us work together and this be the year of the heart and that was kind of an extraordinary thing for an elected official to do, I thought. And um, it was well received, and I know it touched me as elected officials. And sometimes there's, well, not only disagreements, but sometimes there can be unpleasant disagreements. And what she reminded everybody is, yeah, let's just like lead with our heart and have a different kind of year than we've had in 2022. So I thought I would share that. That was terrific. And then lastly, I've been um, pretty active with the Wells Coalition and the um, anti-mine folks. And I'm hoping that our staff, you guys are going to go through the, the final EIR, which was released recently. Yeah, end of December. End of December. And um, the final EIR addressed in the all, what, 6,000 pages or some crazy thing. And But there is a section in there that deals with the the letter that Jennifer prepared at, for our comments on the mine itself. And the consultant or the, the folks doing the EIR had to then uh, take each one of our comments and make an answer. So our staff, my understanding is that you guys are going through it and creating a response or comments or comments to their comments or what, what's happening. We will evaluate whether or not it's appropriate to provide additional comments based off of their responses to our comments. So essentially when they go through and complete the final EIR, they respond to every comment, they identify whether or not they're going to be 
either changing the scope of the project or adding a mitigation measure for the per primary purpose of determining whether they need to reissue the draft EIR because it has fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. The next step is that the final EIR will go before the Planning Commission and then the Board of Supervisors. So our effort will be to review our comments to determine whether or not their responses were appropriate, and that will dictate whether we provide additional comments at the Planning Commission and or the Board of Supervisors. Right. And um, I do want to thank Chip and Doug and Steve. I can't take credit for the comment letter. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but Steve is also the, the in-house expert on CEQAT, so am I missing anything, Steve? Yeah. Well, then, thank you. To yeah. All of you. yeah. Yeah. So that's the end of my report. Just wanted Thanks, to get Ricky. Good. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. So I'd just like to um, uh, comment on um, I got some negative press in December, and I, uh, I was pondering that the past few days, and especially this morning as we talked about the good things that NID is, the day-to-day -day things that we're doing that the public does not hear about. They did print a, a good article about the recent rainfall and cubic feet a second <clears throat> stuff, but I just, want to, I just want to thank the staff for what for the things that, that the, the public generally doesn't hear about, so the things we just talked about. We don't, we're asking questions this morning about power generation, water, and at a so I just want to go on record as, as acknowledging that, even if we don't hear it very much in the press. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Trevor? Uh, well, I'm just getting my feet wet, so I appreciate being here. I appreciate everyone's help. Uh, yeah, literally, uh, if you don't know, uh, about six acres of my ranch <clears throat> serve as a floodplain for Doty Ravine, so I've been watching uh, I have a lake <laughs> in addition to all the ponds, but I have a lake now right out the back window. So um, beautiful. It really is. So I'm worried about the beavers and stuff. I don't know what, what happened with them all, but they were there. So we'll see what Doty Ravine looks like after this. But I see uh, the NID crews out there keeping things clean and um, was able to bring them some donuts the other day. They, they were unbelievably appreciative. <laughs> In fact, they looked at me kind of weird, like, what are you doing here? And it's like, oh, it's for us. <laughs> oh, yeah, the way to their heart is through donuts. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. A guy on a, uh, on a tractor eating donuts, he, he looked real happy. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, it's crab feed season, so I'm sure all your, mm -hmm. your local charities and uh, all the FFAs and um, – uh, get out there and support those guys. Crab is pretty good this year. Oh yeah, crab's gonna be good. Mm -hmm. good. It's always good. good. It, it, yeah. Price, prices of crab feed keep going up. Oh, they're twenty dollars every year. Eight ninety nine at SPD right now. <laughs> I had one more. Okay. Just a real quick one. Uh, kudos to North Yuba Irrigation District. Why? What does get filled? They had a uh, they had problems. And there's a brand new board and a brand new GM. Oh, oh North Yuba. No, Oregon House. Oh, okay. It, it, it was a, people just rose up and took control and they're going to do the right thing. Oh, good. Good to hear. People good to hear. Yep. Okay. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Steve and Chip and Chris and his team for doing an evaluation on a culvert in my area. And um, that was extremely helpful and really appreciated the team coming out in the rain and doing that work. And I do think it's interesting that all of us um, recognize the, the quality of the staff at NID and that um, even when we don't say it, we know it. And a great team that's been built here. here. So um, my only other thing is that on next meeting's agenda, two weeks from today, uh, there will be an agenda item on district priorities. And so Jennifer's going to take the lead on that topic. Mm -hmm. But we're going to also create an opportunity for the board to be able to identify um, smaller potential projects that the district may undertake 
um, for the current calendar year. So these are not, um, they're nothing on the list. They're nothing that's big and monumental from a, a workload perspective, but they may be things that are important to individual directors or we as a group that um, we would like to see as part of the priority list for the district. And it will give it <clears throat> management a time to reflect on whether that, how mm -hmm. that affects workload and other things, but it also gives us an opportunity to be able to identify things that may be important to us that aren't at that super high and complex level. Perfect. That's not whole. I just had one piece of information. It's come to my attention. Um, Director Calder is not going to be here at the next meeting. Okay. And I do think, especially as a new board member, it would be really nice if he was able to participate. Sure. Would you mind if we moved it to the following meeting? No, that would be fine. Perfect. And this will be teed off of the priority spreadsheet mm -hmm. we have seen before. Yeah. So I thought I would give an example, and it may not be too relevant today because we've been getting all this rain, but one of my um, interests is in um, really looking at how our conservation program is, is funded and supported. So um, right now we have a strong conservation program to a degree, but we um, might benefit from making some in, uh, helping um, property owners to address drought through investment. As an example, a tank rebate program. Mm -hmm. That's something that PCWA has been doing for a number of years. So it allows people to extend their irrigation system without accessing NID water if those tanks are filled prior to the end of irrigation season. Just an example, but those are the types of topics I'd like everyone to be thinking about so that when we have that item come before the board, it's not a surprise to you as to what we're talking about. Um, because we will hopefully, at least with Jennifer's support, that yes, this is a doable thing, that we would kind of have a consensus among the board members of those projects that we would like to see added. I think okay. that's a great idea. It is a great idea. Okay, good. So that is the end of my report, Jennifer. I had one thing to add, and I uh, apologize for almost forgetting, but I did want to formally welcome Sandra Dunlap as our new finance director. Sandra joined us about three weeks ago. And she's been a wonderful addition already to our team. I know many of you have already met her, but if you haven't, please take the opportunity to do so. She comes with an uh, excellent background and a wealth of expertise. And she has experience doing a lot of the things that we need done here. So I'm very excited to have her. As are we. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, we'll end this and go on to public comment for items not oh, to be considered in our closed session, which follows. <clears throat> Anyone want to say anything? President Hull, I do expect this to be a lengthy discussion in closed session, but I do not expect any action. Thank you. No readout, you mean? It'll probably be direction given to It'll council negotiators. Okay, with that, we will close close the open session. No, close close close, 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 close something close. and open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take a break. Yeah.